mention, and it's also online under that URL. An artist studio is often the center of domestic life and professional life. In 2003, we undertook to build the first fully integrated, multimodal, sustainable live workspace in Chicago. Dubbed the Greenhouse Chicago, the project evolved into a demonstration project, a piece of public pedagogy. As, as the emphasis turned from art to artist, the studio moved from being the site of production to the object produced. The studio left the practical economy of art production and entered the symbolic economy of future visioning. The studio became the art. The project did not, did not display any new inventions. It deployed an encyclopedic collection of all available systems and strategies, something so radical that evidently nobody is bothered to do it. I have been known to say that this is Duchamp in reverse. Now, as an art student, if you're not up on your Duchamp, you better get busy. <laughs> where Duchamp took objects out of context in the name of art, we put them back where they belong. Meanwhile, I Duchamped my personal politics and convictions down to City Hall. <laughs> the Embedded Artist Project was launched in 2008 and, and evolved directly from the knowledge claim document that we have seen. It is a collaboration from the School of the Art Institute, the City of Chicago, but it is done through the Department of Innovation and Technology. It is not done through, the Depart through Cultural Affairs. As the name implies, because Cultural Affairs has become quite conservative, frankly. As the name implies, artists are embedded in work groups at the city to bring fresh perspectives and cultural literacy to the daily work of the city. There are two embedded artists at this time, myself and another person. Using skills in research communication, qualitative assessment, and intangible values, among others, artists ask new questions and arrive at new answers. Unlike people who talk about problem solving, we are problem finding, which is not fault finding. It's trying to get to different underlying dimensions of the existing problem so that we can look at it differently. I'm embedded with the Urban Brownfields Division of the Department of Environment. They're the people that deal with polluted land. We are developing a new approach to phytoremediation, which is plant-based land cleanup, and it's called slow cleanup, like the slow food movement. This is happening right now, and so I'm going to tell you just a little bit more about it in detail. In this process, I was asked to look at two things. The first was to consider how to use the large number of city-owned abandoned gas stations. 400 exist in Chicago alone and are the legacy of the automobile and the carbon economy. The second thing they asked me to do was look at cutting-edge remediation technologies and ask, what's next? What's the avant-garde of, of remediation? And I wondered, hmm, what's a four-pillar cleanup? <clears throat> I found that remediation specialists we're beginning to connect some dots, but not all the dots, not all four. We said, let's connect all the dots. What does that look like? The aha moment came from the science itself. Here I found the new question. I wondered why so few plants had been tested for phytoremediation. We call it phyto, I'll just say phyto, for phyto. And why they were all agricultural plants. Could other plant types do this remediation? And if so, could the landscapes they offer um, then offer more secondary values? For example, could they look better? I sought a specialist in the field and found, that my, and found my scientific partner at Purdue University. He's a soil scientist. He liked her new question, and together we are building a new plant database to field trial at the gas station sites. We aim to extend the plant palette of known remediators to include ornamental, fruiting, habitat, and biofuel plants. Multitasking. We want multitasking plants. Radically multifunctional. Solve more than one problem at a time. We will use the small gas station sites to make a swatch book of new phytoscapes. Oh, there's a bug up here. I'm attracted. <laughs> We will make new landscape paradigms for the post-carbon city. There are many swatches under consideration. Here are a few. Here are a few more. 
The GIS, GIS skills that I mentioned before are now used to make digital site studies. The Slow Cleanup Program is evolving to include a wide range of partners and community leaders. Utilizing these design civic experiments, we will test our concepts, grow new knowledge, and interpret the process for the public as environmental education. <clears throat> Before showing you the third project, the pedagogical project, from my, my uh, three-sphere diagram, I would like to share, take one side trip and share with you another project to in introduce one more important concept. <clears throat> this is the concept of transferable knowledge um, and the transferable model. Knowledge transfer and the transferable model. In 2008, I went to Darmstadt, Germany, outside Frankfurt, and found my way to the Deutsche Wetterdienst, the German Weather Service, which, if you don't know, is really the premier weather institute in the world. There I encountered the word phenology, uh, from the Greek word phenomai, to come into view. It's the practice of observing natural occurrences like bud burst and bloom time in the spring. Phenology is ancient, but it is undergoing a renaissance since its demotion from, with the advent of instrumentation. But it turns out that phenology, pheno as we call it, so we've got phyto and pheno, yes. Turns out that pheno is an integrated indicator and therefore a great tool to understand long-term climate change in high temporal resolution. One of the oldest data sets is from Cherry Blossom Festival in Japan. They have 750 years of observation of when the cherries bloom. This data set was generated by a sense of beauty, by a worship of nature. It's cultural, not scientific. Hello? Come on. The Deutsche Wetterdienst, the DWD, has a very developed and elaborate pheno observation network and system. They use this polyhedral model of the globe to manage weather data <clears throat> since all cells in this system cover the same amount of area. It's a little technical, don't worry about it. It'd be cool looking about With the help of the DWD, we made a geocaching phenology game for the Hessian forest. I was given the coordinates of the GME mesh at a 500 meter resolution, which was made into a downloadable GPS data set. A website was established, the Phenologic Forest, both in German and in English, where local youth or any volunteers could download the data and upload phenologic observations. The signage shows a citizen scientist and instructs the locals how to participate. In the forest, I placed orange markers every place there was a pointer to get the game going. Even if they were removed, which they were eventually removed by the public, the points, of course, are spatial, virtual, and remain. You can still navigate with your GPS. There's the signage in situ. But this was not the whole story. Something else was happening on a meta level. A reciprocal transfer happened. At the, as the magnitude of achieving a sustainable future becomes more clear, the idea of the transferable model, learning from the success of others, has become both a method and a goal in the global cooperative effort. In this case, two models were transferred between Chicago, Illinois, and Darmstadt, Offenbach. One, the phenologic system evolved by the German Weather Service, is transferred to the city of Chicago. In the other, the concept of citizen science, which goes beyond the use of volunteer observer to a fully cooperative, non-hierarchical model which was very foreign, I have to say, to the Germans, uh, is transferred to Germany via public art. Now, by the way, I'm not just being snide there. We translated the language citizen science, which was evolved through uh, the Audubon Society's Christmas bird count for having citizens do work that, are, that scientists don't have the manpower to do and actually do certain kinds of observation. But when we translated it into the German, they said the translation was correct but they still couldn't get the concept. It literally didn't translate. And we have to ask ourselves, why is it that it doesn't translate? So a long conversation ensued about the untranslatable, about the particular American nature of citizen science. Seriously. So another transatlantic exchange happened. 
a diaspora of knowledge. This knowledge transfer uh, utilizes unlikely connections of art, science, and recreation, changing minds, breaking boundaries that inhibit culture change. Here in the USA, we have a fledgling but emerging pheno system. They say we are the third world of phenology. The Germans say that about us. We have an old lilac program that was started in the 70s. Notice there is no dot in Chicago and not one in DeKalb either. So here, uh, well, I say here in Chicago because I'm not in Chicago, but anyway. In Chicago, I introduced to the city the idea of phenology forming the Great Lakes Basin phenologic system, which is going to be located in the Chicago park system. We will use the city as a laboratory for climate adaptation and climate observation. We will thus facilitate climate monitoring in the Great Lakes Basin. This is not a national model. This is a bioregional model. But others can learn from our example. So two key things here are knowledge transfer, bioregionality, and the, the idea of the apt, the apt application of a concept rather than the origination of the concept. So creativity is about synthesis and implementation. Creativity is not always about origination. Then there is, a, there is a third project that came about at the same time. This is completely in the cultural sector. I had an opportunity to facilitate a phenologic effort at Wesleyan University in Connecticut. For this occasion, it was a school-wide climate change colloquium called Feet to the Fire. What we did is, we, turns out they had a lilac bush right outside the art gallery, and it had been there since the beginning of the, of the, of the college. It was ancient, a really old lilac bush. So we repurposed this existing lilac that was right outside the art center into an observation center uh, uh, site, calling it the Wesleyan Fenno Lilac. <clears throat> for, the, for the exhibition, basically, I produced an oversized 100-year log book to entice them into participation. It's a beautiful, seductive, aesthetic object with a silver embossed logo on the front, oversized, really big. And the idea is to seduce them into observing their own plant. Here's the inside of that, uh, which you can see. So we can see that taking this phenology idea from the German Weather Service and playing it out in three different contexts, that this project that the, uh, shows how knowledge can be transferred. And also, it shows what's called situated knowledge or situated practice. The principles are the same, but they are articulated differently in the three contexts. One for youth in the forest in Germany, one for park goers, a civic exercise in Chicago, and one for liberal arts students in a college looking for an aesthetic experience. Now, returning to, the, to finish the third sphere in the realm of pedagogy, I want to tell you very briefly about the SAIC Knowledge Lab, or K-Lab, Collab, which was built on the What Do Artists Know platform. K-Lab is a collaborative project-based learning space at SEIC that brings academic and studio students together through the lens of knowledge. A new generation of students are learning to collaborate, to think consciously about their expertise and how it positions them to contribute in a larger society and to join together to create systemic works beyond their individual scope. The first group of K-Labbers took up the subject of the food system and began an urban ag project. There was a derelict empty lot in the center of the sculpture department. It was originally built to make cloth art, but that, of course, nobody's doing that anymore. And so it was underutilized for practically a decade. You can see it here, and it never looked that clean as in that photograph. Since 2006, the Avon Gardeners, as they call themselves, have designed and built raised beds, a geodesic greenhouse, and hosted conversations about the future with faculty, students, and visitors from many disciplines. At some point, we heard the language living lab, and this became the conceptual name, the imaginary, if you will, the framework of the project. This language, living lab, is not ours. It was actually coined at MIT, and it means a place where all users participate in the research collectively, kind of like open source. Beyond this, the language implies staying in the question, embracing process, 
expanding community, and above all, taking risks. In our lab, we grow food, we grow ideas, we grow citizens, we grow new questions, we grow new art practice. So the Project SAIC is but one of many living labs around the country, and each is unique because its context is unique. It is a transferable model, like phenology. Unlike Urban Lab, SAIC, DeKalb perches at the edge of the prairie, smack between the urban ecology and sprawl of the metropolitan area, and the richest farmland in the world. While Chicago is guardian to the global water source, Lake Michigan, DeKalb is, crucial, is a crucial location for the future in another way. And now we'll see if this works. Is it working? No. Kind of. We have a little, little Google video there. Here's our site. The plate tectonics here between urban and rural are palpable. It's geologic and it's cultural. The thousands of students at this university are outnumbered only by seed varieties being tested on the surrounding farms, a location of global significance and an awesome responsibility when the food system is in peril, as many think. There could not be a better place to begin asking questions about the nature of nature as it is revealed here, and I suspect the nature of art. We would like to put on the table tonight the idea of a living lab to cow. This site on the channelized Kishwaukee River, the upper south branch of the Kishwaukee to be exact, is under consideration as a potential site for a transdisciplinary living lab. As you know, the Living Lab DeKalb is a project of Art Lab. It can surely be a place where citizen artists and citizen scientists meet to create new cultural futures. But to fulfill its potential, I encourage you to listen to both Dewey and Paul Clay, forget about art, and strive instead to understand the nature of nature. Thank you. I didn't become my own cultural planner. I'm not a cultural planner. I never did cultural planning in my life. I had to create my own venue. So the first thing I had to do was describe the embedded artist and formulate that list and go to the innovation people and say, here is why you need me. I had to learn to dress different. I am not kidding you. I didn't used to look like this. I, I did this on purpose. I wanted to show you, I have to look like I work at City Hall now, right? I used to be in jeans and a t-shirt. So I had to reinvent myself. I had to get different glasses. I had to clean up my hat. You know, I had to, you know, I had to look the part. But it doesn't matter because this is superficial nonsense. This is a symbol system. This is semiotics. I had to fit in, right? Once you get to know you, they don't care what you look like. But anyway, all of these things, you, I, I guess what I'm saying is be strategic. Try to figure out who people are, what you want from them. If you don't see the opportunity you need, create the opportunity yourself. And it's been very complicated to be both the stewardship of the program and the participant in the program. But I'm not the only participant. So I'm managing myself and another embedded artist. It's kind of crazy. But anyway. Uh, you know, you do what you have to do. Invent it. You're inventive. We're supposed to be so bloody creative. Come up with something. Invent process. Sculpt the process. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. You introduced your talk by talking about the mention of the shortcomings of Yes, sir. <laughs> Enlighten you? The systematic division of knowledge into specializations and that trajectory towards specialization that has become more and more and more acute to the place where you have people that can't communicate with each other. And, and as part of that, art, the separation of art and science the separation, well, the separation of art and design, I have to tell you, is very small compared to the separation of, of, of uh, art and science. But these specializations um, that have created, many people think that a lot of the mess that we're in in the world is because of specialization of labor. If you're interested in that topic, I suggest you read something like E.O. Wilson's book, Consilience. Consilience means, I love this, the jumping together of knowledge. Don't you love the idea of knowledge jumping? <laughs> anyway, so consilience is about putting a, the, the whole transdisciplinary conversation 
is about undoing this, this aspect of the enlightenment and reintegrating knowledge. The whole this connecting dots. Sometimes I say I'm a professional dot connector. Just reconnecting the dots. I'll give you an example. So I have this soil scientist at Purdue, and he's a phytoremediation specialist, which means he works with the roots of plants. I began to describe to him, as we think about the apple trees, I described to him how what every gardener in the world knows, which is that the way fruit trees are done, the top of the tree, which is the flavor of the, say, apple, so Granny Smith apple, wine sap apple, is grafted onto a rootstock. And there's a big knuckle where that happens, and you have to be sure that knuckle is planted above the ground. The rootstock is numbered, and the rootstock will decide, will, will make this apple tree dwarf or semi-dwarf or full size, and it will make it have different characteristics. And apple, all fruit trees have been grafted a top and a bottom. They're a hybrid, and they have been for hundreds of years. This is basic fruit cultivation, horticulture, right? Pomology, it's called. So this guy's in the ag department. They have fruit guys at the ag department. He's looking at roots. I begin to describe to him about how we have to find out which rootstocks are going to do the best for the, our, our process. He does not know that fruit trees are grafted onto rootstocks. Mm -hmm. He does not, he's in the ag department and he doesn't know this because he's not a fruit guy. So like the office next to him is the fruit guy. I know and he doesn't know. It. Like what's wrong with that picture, right? And this is a really cool informed PhD with honors like this thing because he studies this and he doesn't study that. So that basic sort of knowledge of how the world is put together has been lost and so that's, Part of it. There's also a whole thing I could talk about about classification and taxonomy, but I just left it out of the talk tonight because it was too much. But try E.O. Wilson's book on consilience, the jumping together of knowledges. Plus, he's a really cool guy. You know, he's an ant. He's an ant scientist. But you know, Francis, if not for the Enlightenment, there wouldn't be this big mess that you have to clean up. <laughs> so thank you. There's a name for that. It's called the redemptive impulse. <laughs> J.B. Jackson wrote about it. You could look it up. The necessity of ruins. I'm sure it's in your library. Really, without without something being a mess, what would we clean up? Right? What would I have to do? Are people curious about uh, the living lab in DeKalb? Do we want to hear more? Yeah. I can't say anything more about that. I've told you everything I know. I think you have to talk about it. I mean, basically, we were meeting, and we were talking about all this kind of stuff, the role of culture, blah, 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 and what the university could do. And um, somehow the Living Lab came up. They had some documents that were from uh, Mary Mist did something called the Living Lab as a park. And so, um, uh, it, it, to me, it was kind of like one of like the phenology thing. It's like, oh, it would be different everywhere you do it. It would be different, you know. So like, well, what's what's the cow got? Well, I'm not kidding you. You think that I'm really saying I'm just saying all that stuff about the farm? You are between the third largest city in the country, 25 percent of the world's fresh water. That would be the Great Lakes system, and the richest farmland in the world. That is where you're located. If you think you are not in an auspicious location for the future, you are in Mecca. And so <laughs> you are, because nothing is going to be as important in the next hundred years other than food and water. So this is the center of the universe. Now, does it look like the center of the universe? No, it's invisible. So your job is to make that legible. I actually like legible better than visible, because visible makes it purely optical, and some of it is not really just optical. It's conceptual dilemma. So I like to say legibility. So the importance of this place may not be, the cultural and the future importance of this location may not be legible, but it is nonetheless going to happen. And so I, Every place, of course, is important in its own way, whatever that is. We have to figure that out. But that, to me, that question, the nature of this place, what is the nature of this place, what could the nature of knowledge, of art, of science, of whatever, what could the nature of that be, and how could you establish a living lab to ask that kind of question? 
What does that look like? I have no idea. It's going to look totally different than what we do. We've got a derelict sculpture yard in the middle of downtown Chicago. I mean, we're doing a totally different thing because we're in a totally different place, right? So what does it mean here? What can it mean? What do you want people to say? Well, what can I know? Well, what do you want to find out? Uh, what kind of questions do you have? Um, it's a place for questions. It's a place, and the reason I like the Dewey quote is that you don't have to understand what it has to do with art to start. You can just follow your interest in any topic. So a lot of students that have entered Knowledge Lab because they were concerned about the food system. They, and they, you know, we say, where's the culture in agriculture? We don't know, it's lost, right? The connection is lost even though the connection was originally there. So sometimes you don't even have an answer, you just have a question. But a really good question will take you a long way. So I think that the, the Living Lab DeKalb is, is really an opportunity to begin asking questions about the future of this place and to understand that the university is in a place. It is not a space station. It is somewhere. It impacts this place. It is part of the watershed. It is part of the energy consumption. You know, it is part of the ecology. It is part of the knowledge economy, surely, here. But it is part of this place. And so what, what does that mean? What can it mean? What should it mean? What's the education of the future? What's art of the future? I would say, what's art 2040? You know, the year 2040. So, what's the Cal 2040? NIU 2040. Yeah. So, set of questions. How do I do? I thinking about uh, our president gave the State of the University uh, recently, and uh, he said we should start thinking about. NIU 2020, so. <laughs> oh, no, it's too late for 2020. <laughs> Besides, it's too hard to think about something so near. It's way more fun to think about something a little further out because you can just really get disconnected from the habits of the now and then work backwards to the now from there. You know, if you say, where do we have to be in 100 years? What's it going to look like in 100 years? Hmm. What's it going to look like in 50 years? And kind of work back. This is Tony Fry's method. Work from the future backwards. So what's the university of, what year is this? 2010. <laughs> <laughs> what happens when you live in the future? <laughs> Were there other questions? All right, thank you for